Today we are continuing our message series in the book of 1 Corinthians, and this series is called Glue, and through it we're talking about, through this book of Corinthians, about how in our lives there are some things that we allow in that tend to tear us apart, and other things that tend to bind us together. And Paul is talking to this church in Corinth, which is a very fragmented and divided church, about uh, these principles and really trying to convey to them how they need to be unified under the gospel, under God's authority as a church. And right now, they're just not doing it. We hear about all kinds of things going on, everything from, from sexual immorality that's become very commonplace within the church's doors to uh, people who are using their, their social clout to take advantage of other people or, or to, to hold things over other people's heads. Uh, there are people who are, who are stepping out and being narcissistic and focusing on themselves, and they're not really focused on the things of God, but on the things of this world instead. And so Paul has been, after, chapter after chapter, pointing a lot of this out and drawing attention to it. And today, we're going to have one of the more controversial sections. It's also one of the longer sections, but I'll, we'll, make a, we'll, we'll go at it in a good clip here. Um, and we're going to talk about sex. Oh, boy. But you weren't ready for that, were you? Um, and so we're going to talk about sex today. And I think this is an interesting subject, not only because it personally fascinates me, but also because in our society, it's an interesting subject. Um, it, it's fascinating to see. There was an era in which the, in the United States, most of our mores in this area would have largely followed Judeo-Christian values. But I don't know if you guys have noticed, but as of late, there has been a lot of controversy in our society about sex, about uh, when it's acceptable, when it's not, when marriage should happen, when it shouldn't. And there's all of these different ideas out there. And our society is so muddled and confused on it that often they don't even seem to know what the difference between a man and a woman is. There's, there's this constant confusion about what defines one, what defines another. And as believers, as we walk through this, it's fascinating because that that was a, there was a lot of that happening in Corinth as well. The, the difference between what the Bible says and what the average citizen of the empire said was pretty vast, and we face that ourselves today. And as we do that, we're really faced with some decisions about who do I believe? Who do I take the authority from on this? Do I, do I trust in what the Word says and what God has to share with me, or do I listen to what society says and try to do things its way? Now, I'll mention, for the people in Corinth, this, this was an especially tricky subject because Christians were a very small minority in Corinth, nowhere near the majority of the population. And within this, this uh, pagan Greek society, they're on the Greek isthmus, but under Roman control, there were all kinds of pagan gods that were regularly worshipped, and sex was actually incorporated into a lot of that. So we talked in these last few weeks about how there were different pagan temples um, that would have been there in the ancient world. In fact, just one of them on its own had over a thousand temple prostitutes that served at it right there in Corinth. And so for the average citizen, if you worshiped all of these different pagan deities, you didn't just believe in one God, but you believed in hundreds of gods. And so one of those gods was supposed to help your fields grow. And so, for example, and so if you wanted to actually increase your crops that year, you were worried about drought or something like that, then as a devout practicing pagan, you would go to that temple and you would pay money uh, to either have heterosexual or homosexual sex, it depended on which, with one of the temple prostitutes, and that would be your form of worship. Now, imagine if you grew up in that, you know, if your dad, when you, when you became a man, said, all right, son, come on, it's time to go down to the temple and for you to sleep with one of the temple prostitutes. Just how upside down would that make your morality? Just how hard would it be to break that tradition? You grew up with this. This was a normal thing. And in Roman society, the rules around sex were much more lax. It was not only common, but it was often expected that men would be unfaithful to their spouses, that they would have affairs. And so you could imagine that if you became a Christian, and this is what you lived for years, you have a lot of habits here you suddenly need to break, right? There's a lot of things that need to look different and that's not an easy thing to do. So Paul is writing today, and we'll see in the first verse as we start, he is writing in response to, uh, to a letter that he's been sent by the Corinthians. Chronologically, we know that Paul sent them a letter as he started to hear about all of the issues in the church. And it sounds like maybe they had some confusion about that when they heard it, uh, probably because he's saying some of the things he's saying today, but didn't elaborate on them quite as much. And so they, in response, wrote another letter to him with a bunch of questions. And today, Paul is going to take a minute to try to answer a ton of those questions related to relationships and sex and when do we get married and when do we not and when should I stay married and when shouldn't I and on down the list. Now, I will mention as we talk about this, um, this is controversial stuff. It's deep to who we are as human beings. And most of us have probably made some mistakes on these friends. I myself have. So most of us have probably made some mistakes. And <coughs> actually, 
When, I, you know, when I'm counseling the average person, one of the most common areas, you might guess this, that we have injuries in our past is related to marriage and sexual relationships and, and these subjects. There can be a lot of wounds that come with them. So I, I have a heart for that as I'm talking about it. Understand, I, I get it. I get it that it's a struggle. Um, and yet, I want to challenge you that as we read through this, I'm not trying to step on your toes. I'm not trying to make you feel awkward. But we do need to have a, a rational conversation about it. We need to really understand what God says about it so we can be obedient to that. And I also need you to understand, if you've made mistakes in this area in the past, Know that God has grace for that, that God has forgiveness for you, and that you know, where you find yourself right now, God can renew you, he can restore you. But the real question is going forward, whose authority will you live by? The world's or yours or by God's? And that's the kind of decision I think that Paul is calling us to make today as we study through this. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 today. If you have your Bible, you're welcome to turn there. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in the seat in front of you. You can grab that. And open it up and use that. If you're using it, today we'll be on page 1,146. As usual, we're going to break this down into six or so sections. We'll, we'll read each one. We'll stop. We'll discuss it. And I hope God will use that to bring it to life for you. Before we continue, let's take a moment and come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is really easy to get lost in what the world says or what our neighbor says or what our parents said or whatever it might be, and to not listen to you. Lord, I know there's a lot of wounds here today from making decisions that were not faithful to you in this. And maybe some people even made the right decisions and they still got hurt. I pray as we walk through this that your grace would abound, but I pray that you'd also open our hearts to the truth of what you have to say. Help us to absorb that and understand it. And as we leave here today, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be changed and our lives would be different because of it. Lord, we love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, chapter 7. We'll begin with verses 1 through 7. Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. And in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am. But each of you has his own gifts from God. One has this gift, and one has that. Okay, so Paul opens up in verse 1, and he says... Now, about the matters you wrote about. So he's saying, I'm, I'm responding to your letter to me at this point. Uh, those other letters, we don't have those, they, but they weren't canon in the Scripture either. Uh, this is what was saved. This is what God's direct inspiration was over. And so this is what's lived on to be part of our Scripture. We can speculate some of these decisions that people are making. His opening comment, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Um, and Paul, we're going to see this juxtaposed idea as we go through it. Paul is going to say, in effect, and I'm going to kind of spoil the ending for you. Paul's going to say, in effect, it's if you would live on mission for the kingdom first and foremost, then it would actually be better to be single as you did that. So uh, here's an example. If God told you, guess what? You have just been called and God wants you to be a missionary to Iran. Well, if you're not aware, Iran is a very hostile place towards Christianity. Uh, Christians are killed there every year simply because they believe in Christ. If you're vocal about it, that is a capital offense in Iran. So just simply going and telling your neighbor about who Jesus is, you could get killed for that. If God told you to do that, as a single person, it would be easier to navigate that situation. You can imagine if you were married and you had children and they went over into this deathly dangerous place with you, your mind would be split between, all right, how do I keep, keep my wife and kids safe? Or how do I keep my husband and kids safe? How do I fulfill this calling while I do this? And Paul points out here, if you're living on mission for Jesus, then actually being single has its advantages. And he'll elaborate more on that in the time ahead. 
But Paul recognizes that's not what all of us can do. And so as we read this, we're going to see it's not you have a good option and a bad option, but it's you have a good option and a better option, and either one is fine. So Paul knows that not everybody's going to be able to do that, or many people are already in a position where they're not able to do that, or they're already married, so that's, that's removed. Um, so he continues in verse 1, it's good um, for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but since sexual immorality is occurring... Each man should have relations with his wife. And Paul, as he continues, he talks about husbands should allow themselves uh, to be, their, their bodies are not their own. They're sharing them with their spouse. And wives, similarly, their bodies are not their own. They're sharing them with their spouse. And uh, this really harkens back to what we talked about in Genesis 2 last week, this idea of when two people get married, the two become one flesh. They're joined together on this deep level. Uh, and, and with that, uh, they're able to fulfill these needs to each other. Now, Paul is saying you guys shouldn't deny each other those sexual privileges inside marriage. Now, he says your bodies are, are, belong to each other. One of the distinctions of that is that means they can't belong to you and to Dionysus. You can't go to her temple and worship her with your body and also have it be your spouse's. Your, your allegiances are split here. So you actually have, your spouse has a say in that, and under a godly relationship, it's not going to be a swinger situation. It's going to be you two dedicated to each other. And yet, at the same time, Paul acknowledges if you're married, it's good for you to have sexual intimacy within that. And so he encourages us, you know, however possible, try to meet the needs of your spouse when you're able to. Now, let's put some obvious bounds on this. You know, if, if your spouse, for example, just gave birth to your first child, hey, maybe you need to take a pass for a day or two. <laughs> cool your jets a little bit. Or if your spouse is really sick, okay, Yes, there's some obvious sensible boundaries here, you know, give them time to recover. Um, But generally speaking, if you're able to meet the other person's needs, you should do what you can to do so. And Paul points out, you're doing this in part because if you don't, then it actually gives some grounds to Satan to cause some temptation. Once we get used to having sexual intimacy, it's very hard to just cut it off. And so if you go months without having any any physical contact with your spouse, that is going to open up your mind to a lot of thoughts that might not have been there before. It's intriguing because uh, as people, particularly people who have cohabitated before they're married, um, which is not an uncommon thing, it, the dynamics of it are very different. When you're dating, you can use sex as a negotiating tool. You can say, you know what, you didn't do what I wanted. And so we're not going to be intimate as a result of this. Um, In marriage, not so much. It's not supposed to be a negotiating thing like that. It's a, it's a base level right. That creates some real interesting challenges for coping mechanisms if you started out living together prior to being married because those expectations actually shift a fair amount. Paul is saying here, do your best to meet those needs within, uh, within marriage. This is part of God's intention for it, that it'll do that. Uh, and and you know, as a result of that, I think you know, for the married people here today, if you want some homework, I think a piece of advice I've given once before of sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is go home, take off your clothes, hug your spouse, and see where things go. Um, that could be a good piece of advice for today. Um, not as many chuckles as I expected. That's okay. <laughs> You'll thank me later, guys. Um, so be, be the, have this dedication to each other. Understand that you're not entirely your own. You're in this covenant with the other person. And uh, you need to watch out for their needs. Paul says in verse 5, do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent for a time. So his only, the only reason Paul could see, uh, as he's writing under God's inspiration here, for why you might say, you know what, we're not going to have sex for a couple of days, is we're dedicating those days to prayer and fasting, and we're going to focus entirely on God. And because of that, we mutually agree, not one of you decided the other person agreed, but you mutually agree that you're going to forgo that while you focus on God. But even then, he says... Uh, Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So he just, he acknowledges that most of us have a struggle with a lack of self-control in this area. And so uh, having that marital union, it's the appropriate outlet for those sexual desires. And that's where it should be. Um, um, Then he says in verse six, this is where it gets a little confusing, but he'll hash this out more. We want to make sure we don't miss what happens here in verses six and seven. He says, I say this as a concession, not as a command. So I say that you should, you, could, you should be married like this as a concession. But Paul really says, he says, I wish that all of you were as I am. Now, this verse gets misread a lot. So what Paul is saying here is that if you forwent marriage, you decided not. If you're single now and you decide, okay, I'm not going to get married, then that's okay. It's actually a good thing. But specifically, it's a good thing if you are as Paul is. So if you decide, I want to stay single because I want to go build a multi-billion dollar business and I don't want anything to get in the way of that, 
That's not a virtuous reason to not do it. Now, maybe if that's where your mind is, you're not ready to get married. There's an argument to be made there. But the idea isn't forego marriage so that you can build your own empire. The idea is if you're going to forgo marriage, forgo marriage so you can live on mission for Christ. And Paul is doing this throughout his life. Ever since he came to Christ, he has been on mission. He's been single the whole time. And so he's saying, if you'll do it the way I'm doing it, and you'll go out there and you'll go to these dangerous places, Paul has been beaten, he's been stoned, he's been shipwrecked, and ultimately, Paul will be beheaded by the Roman government because of his Christian faith. He is walking into dangerous places, and he is telling people about Jesus. And if you make the decision to do that, then being single can have its advantages in that. Your, your, your allegiances aren't spread between two things. You can solely focus on the gospel. And Paul's saying that would be a better way to go. So he wants us to pray about that. Is this what, if you're single, is this what God wants you to do? Does he want you to, to go on mission like this? But notice he says sexual temptation is actually one of the reasons to get married. It's not the only reason to get married, but it can be a reason to. If you're struggling with that, having the appropriate godly outlet for that can be a great way uh, to cope with that. You need to make sure you're in the right place to be married and, and go through the refining process that goes with that. Um, but Paul says that. Now, the last part there, again, which sets context for so much of this, it says, but each of you has your own gift from God, and one has this gift and another has that. So here Paul's noting, not, everybody, not every one of us is made the same. Not every one of us has lived through the same life circumstances. And for some people, the idea of being abstinent their entire life Easy enough, not a problem. And I, I've met people who made this decision. In fact, I've met people who are now in dangerous places in the Middle East that are doing this ministry. They can't even list their name because they'll be killed if anybody ever finds out. And they're doing it as single individuals, and they're, they have felt this calling, and they're living it out, and that's an incredibly virtuous thing. Paul says some of you have that gift, and some of you have this strong sexual desire. And again, marriage is the appropriate outlet for that. That's, that's a good reason for you to get your life squared away, to try to become the person that a good person would want to marry, and with a godly perspective to actually pursue that. But not all of us are in the exact same position. And to be clear, if you're here today and you're single and you're weighing this out, my encouragement to you is pray about it, fast about it, and really ask God what he wants you to do. Ask him for his direction in it. But if you are having regular struggles with temptation in that way, that's probably a sign of sorts. That may be a good indicator that actually marriage is a wise decision, not simply based on that, but, but as a factor to consider. Okay, let's continue on with verses 8 through 11. Now the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his, his wife. So two different things here. The second one's probably the more controversial one. We'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about the first one. So he says, Now to the unmarried and widows I say this, it's good for them to stay unmarried as I do, but if they can't control themselves, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. So if you're single and you're wondering about this, it's that same principle. Make the decision based on uh, what is God calling you to, pray about it, take time to consider it. But if you're struggling with sexual temptation, that might be a sign that God is leading you towards this as the ultimate decision. Um, and that's a fine thing to do uh, in that case. Now, when he talks about the married people, and he's going he's to elaborate on this more as we continue forward. He, he says that wives should avoid separating from their husbands, uh, and, and that husbands should avoid divorcing their wives. Now, in context, when we look at other places in Scripture, we have to understand this in light of other passages. Really what Paul is trying to get at is for the church in Corinth, don't take marriage lightly. Fight for it. Try to make it work however you can. Um, be devoted to it. There are some cases in Scripture where we see, for example, Jesus himself talks about how if, if your spouse has been unfaithful to you, if they cheated on you, then that is in fact grounds for divorce. That can be grounds for ending the marriage. Um, in a sense, the covenant has been broken, that marital relationship, which is a covenant. It's a promise you build your life around. There were terms with it. Those terms have been violated. And so you have a freedom to walk away if you choose to do so. Um, I'll say in terms of separation, uh, we're talking about two separate things here. Uh, separation uh, is, not, is not a tool to be used just for emotional purposes, but in cases of, of abuse that are going on, oftentimes separation can be, I think, the right decision to make. If your family or you are in danger, then you need to have some space. And you can give that other person an opportunity to get on the right track, 
And you might say, well, what if they don't get on the right track? My experience is typically either people get on the right track and start sorting it out, or they don't, in which case they'll do the adultery thing, and you'll have the freedom in that way. But, um, but it's not something that we want to just casually end our marriage. We want to be cautious about that. That's really clearly what Paul's getting to, and he wants us to have that devotion. So what do you do? A, question, a natural question might be with this. Okay, pastor, you're saying that now, but I did end my marriage, and I didn't end it for that reason, so where do I go from here? And a few pieces of advice with that. Um, you know, first of all, Jesus' grace is really big. So God has forgiveness for that. You can move forward. And if you've remarried since, for example, well, then that's the marriage you're in now. Fight for that marriage. Do it in as godly a way as possible and make it count while you're there. God will forgive what's happened in the past. But if we don't want to get in a cycle where we keep repeating all our past mistakes, part of what we have to realize is where we've deviated from God's will. And, and this is a big area of that. Uh, in our culture, marriage is often viewed as pretty disposable. We've got TV shows out right now, for example, where people get married who have never even met each other. Are you really that serious about it if you're doing it that way? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, it might make for good TV, but, it, but it's not actually really uh, thoroughly thought through. And, and as an encouragement for those of you who are not married, this is all that much more reason. The seriousness with which God wants us to wait into marriage is all that much more reason to really vet the people you're talking to. If you've, it, maybe you had a whirlwind for two weeks and you think they're the person you're going to marry, let's wait a little longer than that before we make that decision. Let's take our time, uh, really get to know people. People can put on airs, you know, and all of us try to do it when we're dating. We all try to look as squared away as we can, right? We don't want to look like an utter mess. But, you know, spend enough time with that person to figure out what their character is like, you know, how do they treat other people around them, especially people who have no advantage to them, how do they treat their, their parents. Uh, that's a good indicator for how they might treat you, you know, see, if, see how their character is and do they really love Jesus and make a, a thoroughly vetted decision. Don't just rush into it because uh, mistakes can happen that way. And again, in our society, uh, most people say, you know, if you just have that lovey-dovey feeling, well, that's good enough and you should just get married. Um, uh, that doesn't seem to be actually in keeping with what the biblical concept is. So we've got to have caution there. All right, we have more to look at here. Let's continue on then uh, with verses 12 through 16. To the rest I say this, I not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For an unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and an unbelieving wife has been sanctified through the believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So now we're, we're talking about another specific subset within marriage. And there are many people who have lived through this. There's probably people today who have walked through this. You may have come to find out who Jesus is, and maybe your spouse wasn't along for the journey as a guy or a girl. And so Paul is now giving instruction. And I think it makes a lot of sense in light of some of his general statements, for example, about how it could be better to be single than to be married. That might lead a married person to say, well, I just became a Christian. My spouse isn't really on board. Maybe I should divorce them, and then I'll be single, and that's better anyway. So let's just do that. Paul here is giving a specific instruction of that. And his basic instruction is, if you become a believer and your spouse does not, do not use that as your excuse to just dump them on the spot. Actually, try your best, and you may be in that position for a while, uh, but prayerfully work. Do not nag them to death, but, but try to live out God's values and show his light to them, uh, be an encouragement to them, show them kindness and love, and the hope is in the long run that they might come to the Lord. But to throw the scenario the other way, imagine for a moment that you are actually uh, that you are actually married to somebody. And suppose that you were married and then your spouse became a believer. How would you feel if your spouse came up to you, you know, day one and said, hey, by the way, I went to this church today. I became a Christian. Oh, and we're going to have to get divorced now. That make you think like, I like this Christianity thing. <laughs> Well, maybe if your marriage had been going really badly, you might think it. But, but generally speaking, most of us would not be excited about that. And sadly, I can say as a pastor, I've actually met people who have told me that their spouse has gone and had that experience and come back and specifically ended the relationship because of it. And I'll tell you, the people who I've spoken to, they weren't to say they were happy about it was not the specific nature of it. They were very hurt 
And that's not at all what Paul is saying here. Obviously, when you read the Bible, it's saying the opposite. If you can salvage the relationship, do it. You know, And yes, you're going to be unevenly yoked. And yes, there's going to be some differences in your pursuits. But love that person deeply. And Paul points out maybe through that, through you representing Christ in their life and, and having that sacrificial love for them, maybe that will be the very thing that God uses to draw them into obedience to him. But it's certainly a lot more likely that that will work than you taking the opposite approach and saying, hey, I'm a Christian now, so I'm done with you. That definitely is going to leave some scars and not make the person think, I like Christianity. This is good. Um, Paul says, though, in closing of that section, if you're married, if you're in that position, and the other person sees you and they see the change in your character, and you know, we can imagine in the Corinthian context, they're saying, hey, let's go ahead and go have sex at the temple with the prostitutes. And you say, yeah, I'm a Christian now. I can't do that. And they say, okay, well, I'm done with you then. In that case, Paul says, you know, you're morally in the clear. That's not something you can control. If they decide to leave you based on your devotion to Jesus, then so be it. That's their call. Uh, but God, God is not going to hold that against you. You're not at fault for it. Uh, accept the way it is. And, and from there, you can move on and you can choose to enter into a new relationship uh, if that's what God leads you towards. Okay. Let's continue on with uh, 12, or excuse me with uh, 17, with verse 17. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Well, don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is, is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become human slave. Do not become slaves of human beings, brothers and sisters. Each person, as responsible to God, should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. So now he's addressing two issues, and these have an implication for what we just talked about. We just talked about how if you're married and you can stay married, then do that. If you're already single, then consider staying single, unless the the sexual temptation is there to a point where it's time for you to work on that and look towards marriage. But generally speaking, you stay the way you are. And Paul's building on that to say, hey, there's other areas. This principle, I've carried this through consistently. And first he talks about circumcision. And circumcision, um, the surgical removal of the foreskin on the male reproductive organ, uh, it, is, it was a practice that was common as a, uh, as a way of entering or showing that you were a part of the Jewish faith. Most believers, certainly for the first decade of the church, they were almost exclusively Jewish people. So for the early years of Christianity, basically all Christians were circumcised. And we see in the book of Acts, there becomes a controversy once Gentiles start coming in, once non-Jewish people start coming in and becoming Christians. Then there's this question of, well, do they have to follow the Jewish law and do that step, uh, which typically would have been done in their childhood within their first couple weeks of life? Or, or are they free from that? And Paul has been very consistent in this. He said, you know, if you came to Christ and you weren't circumcised, great, stay that way. And if you came to Christ and you were circumcised, great, stay that way. That's exactly what you should do. Now, some of you may be scratching your head and saying, Pastor, I don't think you can be uncircumcised. That, I don't think that's an option. Um, and I'll tell you, it, as morbid as this might sound, there is actually a, a precedence for it. If you read uh, in... in uh, the apocryphal books of First and Second Maccabees, which are historical books. They're not part of the Bible, but they have some interesting history in them. You'll read about the Greek Peloponnesian Wars and how the Greek, the Greek nation under Alexander the Great came and conquered Jerusalem and all the area around it. And the Jewish people were trying to gain their liberty from that. Judas Maccabee is, is, the, is the main character in it. And you can read about his struggle uh, trying, to, trying to get rid of the Greek government. But as part of the spread of Hellenism, of the Greek culture, there were some things that happened universally. Everybody had to learn the Greek language. That's significant because it actually opens things up for missionaries uh, to be able to spread across the world and ha all have a common language. And then also, 
Uh, everybody had to switch to the Greek currency. That's a new thing, but no more currency exchange in that way. And then finally, another big thing is anywhere they went in a major city like Jerusalem, and this did happen in Jerusalem, they would set up an area for things like the Olympic Games. They would have an arena where there would be athletic challenges that happened, and any able-bodied man was expected to be a part of this. Uh, one of the prom- most prominent things that you would do in the Greek culture, which Jewish people got engaged in at the time, was wrestling. Young men were expected to wrestle, and back then they didn't have singlets. Most of these guys actually, as you can see in the statues of it, wrestled naked. Now, when this happened, you can read about how Jewish people were made fun of because their equipment wasn't quite the same as everybody else's. And some of those men actually went and did their own homemade plastic surgery to try to mutilate things into a condition where it looked like they were. So in the ancient world, there were actually people who tried to do this to change themselves from circumcised to uncircumcised. And Paul's saying, no, no, none of that. You guys, if you were this way when you started in the faith, that's fine. Stay that way and continue with it. Um, And then Paul talks about being a slave or being free in similar context. He says, my precedence for this has stayed the same with that as well. If you came into the faith and you were a slave, now it's good to note for for the sake of explanation, um, this is not slavery like chattel slavery that existed in in the United States. Um, This is a little different form. In the ancient world, slaves were actually often some of the most educated people in society, physicians, lawyers, people like that were often slaves. The, the economy and the world itself was so volatile, sometimes your odds of survival were better if you found somebody who was really successful and just said, hey, I'll be your doctor for your household if you'll make sure I'm fed and my kid, wife and kids have a place to stay, then that works for me. Um, so a lot of people would do that. It was actually a lot closer to indentured servitude in colonial America. So most people would have an opportunity to do side work or to save money and to actually purchase their own freedom from that institution. And so Paul says, if you are a slave, if you can gain your freedom, then great, do that. But if not, you're not actually a slave because Jesus has done something significant in your life to set you free And so even though you're under those circumstances, your heart can be in a different place. You'll be used by God in the circumstances you're in, and he will be at work in that, and that'll be a freedom that you wouldn't have had otherwise. But if if you're not in that position and you're free, then he says, well, don't go and become a slave to somebody. Keep your freedom so that you can actually go do whatever God wants. So you have that freedom to actually pursue the growing of God's kingdom and expanding that out. And so this principle is conveyed... The basic principle, though, is, is however you came into the faith, unless we're talking about a sin issue, which this is not, well, then, you know, you can stay the way you were, and that's just fine. God's not going to uh, throw shade on you for that, and you can, you can still be faithful to him. Okay, uh, continuing on then, verse 25. Now about virgins. I have no commands from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who the Lord's mercy is, tr- uh, who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy, because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they do not. Those who are happy as if they were not. And those who buy something as if it's not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form, is passing away. Okay, so Paul starts off again with a similar principle. Now we're talking about people who are single. We're talking about, uh, in that case, he says, if you're already married, well, then stick it out. Fight for that marriage. If not, if you're single, well, then it might be better for you to stay that way. And again, my encouragement is pray fast, seek God's wisdom on that. Um, But if you're going to live for the kingdom, then that might be the better decision. Uh, but if not, then, then you aren't sinning. He's really clear. You haven't committed a sin. If you decide to get married, if, if that's the way that God leads you, then good. The other way might be better in some cases, but this is still a very good thing. Um, but make the decision that way. In the, and as he goes on here in verse 28, in the second part of it, he says, but those who marry will face troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. Um, again, we kind of get back to in the era of persecution that's going on for early Christians, 
it would be tricky. It would be tricky to negotiate that even as a single person. But if you know that there are people who might decide to kill you simply because you believe in Jesus, is it going to be a lot easier to escape with just you running away or with you and a bunch of small kids and your spouse? One will be easier than the other. And not just that, but in an era where starvation is common, where famine occurs, where hardships come, and Christians are not immune to these things. So you as a, as a spouse are going to have an obligation to work, to provide, and to take care of, and to persevere through that. And Paul says you may even be spared some pain if you decide to stay single. If you're already single and you decide to stay that way, specifically so you can be on mission for Jesus, well then you won't have to be focused on that. You'll just go where God sends you. And Paul talks about this in his own life. He talks about, he goes to various places. In some places, he's nearly starving to death. There's times in the book of Acts where we see he's almost dead from disease along with everybody with him. Barnabas is there with him, and they think they're going to lose their lives. Time and time again, they're facing hardship for the gospel. And Paul's pointing out that the math on this just gets simpler if you're signal. So if you're going to live for the kingdom first, consider it. And again, we can take what he said before into consideration. If, you're, if, if the sexual desire is there in such a strong way, well, then get married. That's good. Do that. That's a good thing, too. Um, verse 29 onward is pretty confusing when you read it. It almost makes it think, seem, seem at a glance like he's saying, well, if you're married, just pretend like you're not, you know? Just, just ignore your wife and pretend like they're not there. That's not what he's saying. Paul's pointing out that if you're living on mission for the kingdom, that oftentimes you're going to be in this place where whatever place you find yourself, you have to try to push yourself towards another one. So, so you're in the kingdom and you're married, but if you're really on mission for God, then there's going to be times where you feel this push-pull of, am I spending enough time with my wife? Am I spending enough time with my kids? Am I balancing that well? I know I'm called to go share the gospel over here and to go and serve at the church in this way. And so how am I, how am I balancing that? Well, you're going to have to live with an eye on both with an eye on your family, being faithful and fulfilling the commitments that God has given you, and also with, with an eye on the calling that God's given and the church that you're led to and the ways that you're supposed to be serving. Your eyes will be fixed on both, and, and you'll have to work through that. And you may have times where you're sad and where you're really struggling, and God's going to call you in light of your pursuit of the gospel to work, to focus on being happy and to try to turn that around. And there's going to be times where you're really happy and things are going well, but other people in your life are going to be going through hard stuff, and you're going to take a step down in how you feel. Really, he's pointing out the things of this world are going to pass away, and so focus first on the gospel and that. Still fulfill your commitments. Uh, and I'll point out, this is probably apparent, but uh, in the ancient world, there was no such thing as birth control. So if you were married, uh, not only would you, would you um, obviously have a spouse, but then also for most people who are biologically capable, they'd have children. And probably, at least if they fulfill what Paul said at the beginning of this and don't deny each other sex whenever the other person wanted it, you probably have a bunch of kids on top of that. So that's a pretty big commitment that you'd have there. Uh, and there's a lot of pull to it. But you have to try to find this balance between being faithful to, to your family that God has called you to and then also being faithful to the kingdom at the same time. Uh, and that dichotomy is going to be there, but God can help you find balance in that. Okay, verses 32 through 40. Let's finish this out. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How can he please the Lord? But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world. How can he please his wife? And his interests are divided. Unmarried women or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned with the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in the right way, in undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone's worried that he might not be acting honorably towards the virgin he's engaged to, and if his passions are too strong, and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. A woman is bound to her husband as long as she lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Okay, so a few things 
there. In verse 32, he's really expanding on what we read before, this idea of singleness does have a gift if you're focused on the kingdom. It does have a gift. You have a singular purpose, and there's clarity to that, and there's an ease with that. But again, if you're married or, or if you're feeling God's calling to be married, then go do that. You haven't sinned. It's a good thing, uh, and, and embrace that. God made marriage. Just to be clear here, we often think about this, I think, as we read it. We misread it as, oh, God won't like me if I'm married, but he will like me if I'm single. That's not what's going on here. And by the way, if you're single and you're not living for the kingdom, then you're doing no better anyway. Um, but, but really, he's saying there's two good options, but I want you to weigh it out because if you're being led towards that missionary lifestyle where you can really be on fire for Jesus and totally devoted to that, there's advantages to it. Then he talks about engagement. In verse 36, he starts covering that. If anyone's worried that he might not be acting honorably towards a virgin he's engaged to, and his passions are strong, and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. So the idea here is he knows there's people he's writing to in Corinth. It's a big city. It's a big church. If you're engaged right now, and you feel like, hey, this is the right thing to do, I have these desires, and I think this is going to help fulfill those desires in a godly way, then do that. That's fine. And then he gives the counterpoint of, but if you're there, and maybe you're engaged, but you're starting to realize, you know what, I hear what Paul says, and I'm realizing I don't really have those strong desires, and I do really just want to be on mission first and foremost, well, then that's a better thing even yet. That's fine. Go ahead and do that too. The last paragraph gives some instruction, and again, we touch on some controversial stuff. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes. So we've already talked about separation uh, or divorce and context for that, that, that infidelity is what Jesus lists as the criteria for that. Now we're talking about a different thing. We're talking about widowhood. It is interesting, uh, I'll point out, in Timothy and Titus, when they talk about, they, they specifically say, if a younger woman uh, is widowed, uh, that it actually might be better for, for her to remarry. And then basically he says, because she might become a busybody, which I thought was, was an interesting assertion. Might get really gossipy and divide people, and, and maybe it would be better to just focus on a spouse and family. Um, and, and you can use that to supplement this in a sense. But, um, but what he's saying here is, if you've done that and you decide to stay single, then that's great. Uh, God will bless that. And if you decide to remarry, that's okay. But we've got to make sure we read all of that. Uh, last part of verse 39, he says... Uh, but he must belong to the Lord. And really what he's getting at here is if you're a widow and you're looking to remarry, or, or we can even add to this a similar emotional experience, if you've just been through a divorce and you're deciding to remarry, then make sure whoever you are looking at is really committed to Jesus. Follow through with that. Uh, all of the criteria the Bible lays out for that. Pursue the relationship in a godly way and, and actually find out, thoroughly vet this person and see that they're there and that that's where their heart is. I'll tell you guys, as I walk through with people who go through these experiences, this is a really heavy burden when we talk about being widowed uh, or we talk about having, ha having dealt with a divorce. And there's three pieces of advice I typically get to anybody who goes through that. I want to give this today in case somebody online or with us in person has recently dealt with it. My three key pieces of advice, if you've walked through this, it's a big trauma. And it's not something that 10 minutes later you just get over. It takes time to heal from the injuries that this has. And because of that, I'd encourage you to avoid making any major financial decisions after something like this happens. If it's either case with widowhood or divorce, you know, you might not be able to run the ranch on your own, for example. So you might have to actually make a decision that way. But to the best of your ability, avoid making those major financial decisions. When your heart's broken and you're reeling and you're not sure which way is up, that's not the best time to make a decision that affects the rest of your life financially. So give it some time. Give it a year for that. My second piece of advice is avoid drugs and alcohol entirely during that one-year time frame. Just commit to at least do that. I had a good friend here a couple of years ago who walked through this, and, and largely because of his faith, his wife said, hey, I'm done with you, and I'm done with all this. I want to go party and have fun, and you're not doing any of that. And I told him this exact advice, and it was funny because he called me a few days later. I, I talked to him the day it happened, and a few days later he called me, and he said he had no less than three people who the first day when he announced it said, dude, I'm so sorry. Let's go party at the bar tonight. Let's go straighten this out. I know how to get your mind out of this. And, and that was the idea. We'll solve it by going and getting sloshed, and that'll fix it. And folks, if, if you didn't have a problem with alcohol before, when you're heartbroken, if you're trying to medicate your pain through it, that's a really quick way to get there. Um, so out of, out of love, I tell you, I, I would not do that either. And finally, if you're in that position, don't enter into another relationship for at least a year. You need time to heal and figure out where up is. So give yourself time and space to heal and to move forward. And, and wait at least a year to consider it. 
Uh, again, I'm not saying you'll go to hell if you don't. I'm saying you're going to make a lot better decisions if you actually walk through it that way. A, a weird thing with that same friend as I talked to him about it, uh, he had three different women who made, who made passes at him the very week that he became signal. It was like he was on the list, and they were just like, if that guy ever becomes signal, I'm, I'm making a move. And you don't make wise decisions when you're in that position. You, know? you don't have your eyes fully open. Your heart's broken. And there are people out there who will try to lock you down while they can. They'll, they'll try to, to, in a sense, take advantage of that. Their motive may not be taking advantage, but, but the effect is you're not in a place to make a wise decision, and so you might very well not make a wise one. So exercise caution in those circumstances. Here Paul is saying, if you go through that, if you decide to remain single, cool. Then do that and serve the kingdom first and foremost. If you want to get remarried, that's okay. Do that too, but do it the way Jesus says to do it. Not the way culture says, not the way that feels right, but take your time, get to know the other person's character, see what their integrity is like. Make sure that they don't just like talking about Jesus, but that they actually like obeying him because those are different things. And if you do that, you're going to make a whole lot better decision out of it and your life will be less messed up as a result. All right. So what do we do with all this? Well, I think one of the key themes we can see here is Paul is pointing out to us under God's inspiration that relationships can be messy and we can make all kinds of crazy decisions with them and there can be a lot of hurt that happens with that. And and not only that it can hurt us, but it can hurt those around us and it can even affect the way that we serve the Lord uh, if we don't act wisely with these decisions. And so again, if you've walked through this and we're talking about it and you say, boy, pastor, I've done almost every one of those things wrong. There's grace for that. That's okay. God, God forgives that, um, and, and he has new life to give you. But understand where you've gone wrong in the past. Own it. And as you look forward, make sure that you're doing it the way that God says. And maybe, uh, maybe you've been through that hurt, and you're in a relationship now. Again, if you're in, in a new marriage, then fight for that uh, and, and fight to make that work as much as you can. The, the, the past mistake, that's not what defines things. What you do right now is what counts. That's what you have control over. Um, for the rest of us, just let's try to make sure that we're making these decisions going forward. For all of us, making decisions that are centered on the kingdom. You notice the common theme in all of this. It's not entirely about sex. Sex is one chunk of it and the relationships that surround it. But one of the biggest parts about this is having an eye to the kingdom first. And so as you're thinking about your relationships, really think about God's kingdom and take that into consideration. And ask him what you should be doing. Ask him for his direction in that and let him guide you. I want to share a brief personal story and then uh, we'll, we'll pray and have a time, have our communion offering time. Uh, years ago, I, I wrestled with this myself. I, when I became a Christian, I was 16 years old and I had just enough wisdom to know at that time God was telling me like, Lloyd, you can't handle dating right now. You are too broken. So wait until I tell you. And so I was 21 before I started dating. And at that point, I hadn't dated, and I wondered, like, will any girl actually go out with me? Or, or will I even know what to do if a girl does go out with me? Can I convince them to go out a second time, or is that even possible? You know, how will that work? And so much of what I did in my early dating life was just trying to answer some of those questions. But eventually I realized I was really excited about the idea of having a girlfriend, but I wasn't as excited about the idea of having a wife. Not that I was against it. I always told myself, eventually I'll go to that but my heart wasn't really set on it. And there was a big transformation that happened in my own life. I weighed out these passages and I weighed this out in my own life. And I knew, as as I've admitted to you guys before, that pornography was something I struggled with years ago. And that was a factor. And I would go months without it. And then I'd fall back into it. And and so I knew I did struggle with some of those temptations. And one day uh, in the summer, I, I, about a month before school started, I'd just done an internship down in New Mexico. And I prayed to God and I basically said, Lord, I've been looking for a girlfriend a long time. And I really would love to have a wife. If you would lead me the right person that I could have as a wife to build a life with, that would be a huge blessing. And I think that God, in a lot of ways, was waiting for me to come to that point. And interestingly, my wife had recently, my now wife, who wasn't my wife then, uh, had recently come to some epiphanies of her own. She'd had this cake shop she was supposed to be taking over uh, as a business. She was supposed to be owning it. And about the time I said this prayer, all of that fell apart. <laughs> And in desperation, she just said, Lord, whatever you want next, I'm, uh, I'm in for it. If she'd only known what she was signing up for. But, um, <laughs> but it worked out for me, at least. Um, so that, you know, that, that week, the next week, the first day in Greek class, I met her. Uh, we went out on a date that week, and I, I figured out pretty quickly, unless there's something here I'm missing, this is it. I'm going to marry this girl. And, and nine months later, that's where we went. Uh, we became married, and it's been one of the best decisions I've made in my entire life. I point that out to say, though, I think one of the things God was waiting for 
was for me to not just be in pursuit of his kingdom, which I was doing. I'd been doing street evangelism and all kinds of things like that. But he was waiting for me, too, to have a heart that was ready for that. If he had sent me my wife a year before, I would have dated her. But I don't know if I would have actually had the sense to realize, you really need to marry this girl. And would that have helped the relationship work or would it not have? You know, that probably would have sabotaged it. In our own lives, we all need to pray for God's guidance and for his direction. And we need to make sure whatever we do, he's at the middle of. Because when he is, that's when his blessing comes. That's when it pays off the most. At this point, I'm going to ask Amy to come forward and lead us in a closing song. And as she does, I'll ask you to join me for a moment of prayer, and then I'll lead you in our communion time. Heavenly Father, we know that there's some wounds surrounding these issues, and they're heavy subjects, and yet, Lord, we know that you're a God who takes broken things and makes them new. I pray that if we have any of those hurts, that you'd be at work healing them. Lord, I pray for those who are married, that you would strengthen and fortify their marriages, that they'd move their hearts into a deeper obedience with you, Lord, if we have people here today whose spouses aren't on board, I pray that you would tear down the boundaries that are between that. You'd open their hearts to the reality of you and help them to be transformed for that. And I pray you'd give wisdom to the Christian spouse as they walk through that. And Lord, for those who are single here today, asking themselves these big questions about what their future should look like. Father, I pray that they'd get a clear sense of your desire for that. And not just that, but they'd pursue it in your way so that they can yield the blessings you have in it. Please guide our steps and help us to live at a deeper level of obedience so that our relationships glorify you, so that our church is in better shape because of it, so that our families and our work environments are in better place because of it. Glue us together in your will. I ask in Christ's name, Lord. Amen.